Good morning, everyone. I'm really uh, delighted to be here on this uh, snowy Riga day. It's uh, really always a great pleasure of mine to speak with uh, students. And I have to tell you, I have a special uh, soft spot for law students because I hope you can help me understand some of the challenges of international law that confront us every day at NATO. So I'm going to be addressing two major uh, areas uh, in this realm one with regard to international law uh, on the side of some of our big, uh, big treaty regimes. But the other is a more recent focus, and some of you may have seen that Angelina Jolie uh, visited NATO headquarters a few days ago. And uh, her visit there marked the kind of launch of a new uh, emphasis from Secretary General Stoltenberg on down throughout the alliance on uh, 1325 issues, issues related to women, peace, and security, and UN Security Council Resolution 1325. So I'm going to concentrate on those two big areas of international law, and I'll look uh, forward to our question and answer period and to hearing your views. But I want to start uh, by talking a little bit about NATO's adaptation, including EFP, the Enhanced Forward Presence. I was out yesterday at Adige at the, at the base there and got to see how uh, the battle groups have taken shape that contribute so strongly to the deterrence and defense in this alliance. And so first of all, I just wanted to express my admiration for the work that Latvia has uh, done to serve as the host nation to provide uh, for the facilities at Adige to, I saw there was a lot that had to be done to, in rapid uh, way, build up infrastructure and so forth. So I also want to convey a word of admiration for Latvia and the role that you have played in uh, deterrence and defense of the alliance. But uh, I wanted also to focus in, as I begin my remarks, on Russia's violations of international law. I mentioned the big regimes. Some of you may know my background is as an expert on arms control treaty regimes, including the non-proliferation regime and also uh, strategic arms reduction and control. Russia has uh, been, in my view, uh, really skating the edges uh, at a minimum and in some cases uh, uh, in non-compliance with important treaties and agreements. The importance of arms control agreements, uh, we can focus on the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty or the INF Treaty. NATO's uh, main purpose is to defend our countries, and we've helped keep the peace in Europe for nearly seven decades. We've been successful because we have been able to adapt. I think our ability to adapt derives in part from our ability to listen to one another and to learn. All 29 members of the alliance, and I want to stress that this is an alliance that operates by consensus decision making. So each member of the alliance is an equal decision maker at uh, the table, and that is an important facet, I think, of our strength. Uh, we are regularly sitting together and discussing the security challenges we face. Together, by consensus, we decide how to address those issues, and together we reap the benefits of this enduring commitment to our collective defense. So again, I wanted to stress how appreciative we are uh, for the work that Latvia has been doing coming out of the Warsaw Summit in 2016 to establish one of four battle groups here in Latvia. The other three, of course, in Estonia, in Lithuania, and in Poland. I will be going to Lithuania on Monday, so I will have an opportunity to visit their battle group as well. And last April, I was in Estonia. So the fourth one, uh, and the one I need to visit next, obviously, is in Poland at, at Bydgoszcz. These deployments in Latvia and the three other countries here in the East are part of the largest reinforcement of NATO's collective defense since the end of the Cold War. And I want to stress, I was so impressed yesterday at Adige to see, as I, I've said, from the south of the alliance all the way to the north, and then the transatlantic part is included as well, because I was able to visit yesterday with units from Albania, far in the south of the alliance, Italy, Poland, Slovenia, Spain, and soon the Czech Republic, all of them together at Adige and providing, again, for our collective defense. But Canada, 
of course, is uh, the lead nation working together with, uh, with Latvia and uh, seeing the presence of the Canadians there and talking to both the Latvian commander of the overall brigade but also the, the, uh, the Canadian uh, lieutenant colonel and realizing how closely Canada and Latvia are working together in this effort was, was very, very impressive uh, to me. So ne next, I think we are going to have to uh, focus on reinforcement and how the battle groups will work together with reinforcing capabilities such as our very high readiness joint task force, the VJTF. And that will be a big set of issues that we contemplate as we move to a NATO summit meeting in July uh, of the coming year. But let me come back to the legal questions that are of greatest interest to you. And uh, I wanted to talk about the response to Russian actions. NATO has taken steps uh, here uh, with the battle groups uh, in the Baltic states and Poland, and also in other aspects of what we are doing in the alliance, in direct response to Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea in 2014, and its ongoing military buildup in this region. And I visited with the Ministry of Defense this morning and had a very good briefing talking about the pressure of Russian troops uh, in the region, um, really up against, uh, against the borders of NATO in the Baltic region. The violation of Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity and the violation of international law that took place in 2014, and that continues to this day, is a matter of great concern to me personally, but also to NATO and to all of NATO's allies. NATO does not and will not accept Russia's illegal and illegitimate annexation of Crimea, and we condemn Russia's ongoing destabilization in eastern Ukraine. Russia's aggression is an attack not just on Ukraine and its sovereignty and territorial integrity. It is, it is an attack on the post-World War II rules-based international order upon which peace and security in Europe have depended for the past seven decades. The United Nations, the European Union, and NATO are all products of that rules-based order. So let me be very clear about the violations of international law that Russia has perpetrated in Ukraine. Russia is in violation of international law in several very specific instances. Article 2, 4 of the UN Charter, the Helsinki Final Act, and the 1997 Treaty of Friendship between Russia and Ukraine, which specifically recognized Ukraine's territory within the borders that existed at the time of the Soviet breakup in the early 1990s. And to my mind, it's very interesting that the Russians have not abrogated this 1997 treaty. Very interesting. In 2014, the UN General Assembly adopted a resolution calling upon states and international organizations not to recognize any alteration of the status of Crimea resulting from Russia, Russia's actions. And I want to say this matter, I think, is extremely poignant here in the Baltic states. I Obviously, I'm an American. I'm now the Deputy Secretary General of NATO, so I'm an international civil servant. I'm not representing my own country as I stand before you today. But I very well remember the Cold War years and how my own country, the United States, refused to acknowledge for all those years that the Baltic states were a part of the Soviet Union as the Soviets wanted. And so I think that refusal, it's important to acknowledge, recognize, and embrace now as we consider the situation in Crimea. We must not, we must not recognize any alteration of the status of Crimea resulting from Russia's actions. By contrast, and here I want to stress this, and I'll be glad to discuss it further, Everything NATO does is strictly defensive. It is intended to prevent conflict, not provoke conflict. Our actions are transparent and fully in line with our international commitments. Now, let me turn for a moment to the arms control regimes, the INF Treaty I mentioned at the outset. The INF Treaty removed a whole class of weapons, intermediate range missiles, from Europe indeed banned them globally. Their only purpose was to threaten European cities, including, frankly, Moscow. 
with short notice destruction. Intermediate range missiles have a very fast flight time to target and so they are weapons meant to wreak havoc on very short notice. The treaty did a huge amount to contribute to strategic stability and reduce the risk of miscalculation leading to conflict. In December, the North Atlantic Council, which is NATO's highest decision-making body, the NAC, as we call it, issued a statement in support of the INF Treaty. The alliance is united. We know that effective arms control agreements are an essential element of our collective security. Unfortunately, Russia has deployed a new missile system that the United States, as a signatory of the treaty, affirms is in violation of the INF Treaty. To violate the treaty now, would be a terrible blow to Euro-Atlantic security. So we have called on Russia to answer valid concerns about the new missile and to respect the INF Treaty. If you take a broader view and go beyond the nuclear treaties and agreements, think about the Treaty on Conventional Armed Forces in Europe, Open Skies, and the Vienna Document. Russia has also been undermining these treaties and agreements. The result could be a destabilizing arms race, something that we have experienced in the past in the Cold War years and no one wants to see again. We need not repeat that experience, nor would I argue can any of us afford to. For our part, NATO certainly does not want a new arms race. We strongly support effective arms control agreements and the well-established international legal framework surrounding them. I've touched on NATO's adaptability, international law with regard to Ukraine and the importance of arms control, especially the, arm, the INF Treaty, but I think the conventional arms control treaties and agreements also are, they're, they're very important for establishing mutual predictability and raising confidence, enabling us to understand better what the Russians are uh, up to, but they should care about understanding better what we are up to as well, again, to convey to them that our actions are defensive, proportionate, and in line with international law. But let me now turn uh, to another um, set of issues, and that is the 1325 set of issues. I want to underscore inclusion and gender equality relate directly to the fundamental values on which the NATO alliance is based democracy, individual liberty, human rights, and again, the rule of law. When it comes to gender, doing the right thing and doing things right go hand in hand. I always say that we cannot afford to leave 50% practically of the global population outside of global decision making and global problem solving. It's the right thing, but it's also the way to do things right, to have women engaged at every level. That is especially true with regard to women in the armed forces. As I mentioned a moment ago, UN Special Envoy Angelina Jolie visited NATO headquarters on Wednesday. The purpose of her visit was to highlight an issue that concerns us all, and that is the issue of preventing sexual or gender-based violence in conflict. It's a, it's a subcategory, it's one of two pillars of UN Security Council Resolution 1325. So her focus is particularly in that area, but 1325 is broader than that, and I think there are many areas where we can work uh, to improve uh, the implementation of that important UN Security Council resolution. For nearly 70 years, NATO has stood for collective defense against military threats, based also for the defense of democracy, individual liberty, and the rule of law. Therefore, in our view, NATO has a responsibility to be a leading protector of women's rights. We know from experience that strengthening the role of women is the smart thing to do, as I mentioned a moment ago. And NATO has a long record of fighting extremist groups such as the Taliban and ISIS. These groups have the oppression of women at the very core of their modus vivendi, how they go about operating in the world, and their overarching ideology. So despite being prohibited by international law, very clearly sexual violence continues to be employed as a tactic of war in numerous conflicts. And that is what the Secretary General of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg, and UN Special Envoy Angelina Jolie were talking about on Wednesday, that as a matter of high priority, NATO will now be tackling these issues 
working together with international organizations such as the UN, but also with organizations such as the African Union, the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. There are many ways I think international organizations can work together more effectively to try to tackle these problems. We have a responsibility to do better. Fulfilling the promise of the Women, Peace, and Security Agenda will make an important, lasting contribution to creating a more peaceful and sustainable future for succeeding generations. I'm confident that a strong alliance, united by our shared values, will continue learning and adapting. It's important that no organization stand still. It constantly must be learning, adapting, and changing to the external environment. So we will continue to be protecting the nearly one billion citizens that make up uh, the membership of this alliance, both on this side of the Atlantic and also, let us not forget, not only the United States, but also Canada, your important partner here in Latvia for uh, the, the battle group. The population of the NATO countries, they depend on NATO for peace and security and safety, and so we will continue to be very serious about those commitments and to be working very hard to fulfill them. With that, I look very much forward to our discussion. I hope to be able to answer your questions, and uh, I'm very interested in hearing your view, as I mentioned at the outset, on these issues of international law that I have raised or on other issues that you may wish to bring to my attention. So thank you very much for this opportunity, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you.